you've said that uh, with this metaphor analogy that uh, theory of everything is a big mountain and you have a sense that however far we are up the mountain that the the Wolfram physics model a view of the universe is at least the right mountain. We're the right mountain, <laughs> yes, without so, question. So I'm, I'm, which aspect of it is the right mountain? So for example, I mean, so th there's so many aspects to just the way of the Wolfram Physics Project, the way it approaches the world, that's, um, that's clean, crisp, uh, and uh, unique and powerful. So, you know, there's a, there's a discrete nature to it. There's a hypergraph. There's a computational nature. There's a generative aspect. You start from nothing. You generate everything. Which do you think the actual model is actually a really good one, or do you think this general principle of from simplicity generating complexity is the right? Like what aspect well, of think, the mountain? Yeah, is the right. Current? I mean, I, I think that the the kind of the meta idea about using simple computational systems to do things that's you know that's the ultimate big paradigm that is you know, sort of super important. The details of the particular model are very nice and clean and allow one to actually understand what's going on. They are not unique. And in fact, we know that. We know that there's a, a, there's a large number of different ways to describe essentially the same thing. I mean, I can describe things in terms of hypergraphs. I can describe them in terms of higher category theory. I can describe them in a bunch of different ways. They are in some sense all the same thing, but our sort of story about what's going on and, and the kind of kind of cultural mathematical resonances are a bit different. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's perhaps worth sort of saying a little bit about kind of the, the you know, foundational ideas of, of uh, of uh, uh, you know of these of these models and things. Great. So, can you maybe uh, can we like rewind? We've talked about it a little bit, but can you say like what the central idea is of the Wolfram Physics Project? Right. So, so the question is, we're interested in finding a sort of simple computational rule that describes our whole universe. Can we that's, just pause on that? It's just so beautiful. That's such a beautiful. That's such a beautiful idea. That we yeah. can generate our universe from a from a uh, from a data structure, a simple structure, simple set of rules, and we can generate our entire universe. Yes, that's, that's all inspiring. Idea. Right, <laughs> so, but but so so you know the question is, how do you actualize that? What might this rule be like? And so one thing you quickly realize is, if you're going to pack everything about a universe into this tiny rule, not much that we are familiar with in our universe will be obvious in that rule. So you don't get to fit all these parameters of the universe, all these features of, you know, this is how space works, this is how time works, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You don't get to fit that all in. It all has to be sort of packed in to this, this thing, something much smaller, much more basic, much lower level machine code, so to speak, mm -hmm. than that. And all the stuff that we're familiar with has to kind of emerge from the operation. of. So the, the rule in itself, because of the computational reducibility, it's not gonna tell you the story. It's not gonna give you the right. answer to, uh, it's not gonna let you predict what you're gonna have for lunch tomorrow. Right. And it's not going to let you predict basically anything about your life, about the universe. Right, But and you're not going to be able to see in that rule, oh, there's the three for the number of dimensions of space and so on. Right. So that's not gonna be so the space time is not going to be obviously. Right, so the question is then what what is the universe made of? That's that's a it's a basic question, and we've had some assumptions about what the universe is made of for the last few thousand years, that I think in some cases just turn out not to be right, and you know the most important assumption is that space is a continuous thing, that is that you can if you say let's pick a point in space we're going to do geometry we're going to pick a point we can pick a point absolutely anywhere in space precise numbers we can specify of where that point is. In fact, you know, Euclid, who kind of wrote down the original kind of axiomatization of geometry back in 300 BC or so, um, you know, his, his very first definition, he says, a point is that which has no part. A point is this, is this you know, uh, this indivisible, you know, infinitesimal thing. Okay, so we might have said that about material objects. We might have said that about water, for example. We might have said water is a continuous thing that we can just, uh, you know, pick any point we want in, in, in some water. But actually, we know it isn't true. 
we know that water is made of molecules that are discrete. And so the question, one fundamental question is what is space made of? And so one of the things that's sort of a starting point for what I've done is to think of space as a discrete thing, to think of there being sort of atoms of space just as there are atoms of material things, although very different kinds of atoms. And by the way, I mean, this idea, you know, there were ancient Greek philosophers who had this idea. There were, you know, Einstein actually thought this is probably how things would work out. I mean, he said, you know, repeatedly, he thought this is where it would work out. We don't have the mathematical tools in our time, which was 1940s, 1950s, and so on, to explore this. Uh, People, like the way he thought, you mean that there is something very, very small and discrete that's underlying space. Space. Yes. And that, that means that, so, you know, the mathematical theory, mathematical theories in physics assume that space can be described just as a continuous thing. You can just pick coordinates and the coordinates can have any values. And that's how you define space. Space is this just sort of background uh, sort of theater on which the universe operates. But can we draw a distinction between space as a thing that could be described by uh, three values, coordinates, and how you're, are you, are you using the word space more generally when you say? No, I'm, I'm just talking about space like as in what we experience in, in, in the universe. So that you think this 3D aspect of it is fundamental? No, I don't think a 3D is fundamental at all, actually. I think that the, what's the, the, the thing that has been assumed is that space is this continuous thing where you can just describe it by, let's say, three numbers, right. for instance. But the most important thing about that is that you can describe it by precise numbers, because you can pick any point in space, and you can talk about motions, any infinitesimal motion in space. And that's, that's what continuous of, means. That's what continuous means. That's what, you know, Newton invented calculus to describe these kind of continuous small variations and so on. That was, that's kind of a fundamental idea from Euclid on. That's been a fundamental idea about space. And so- Is that right? Or wrong? Uh, it's, it's not right. It's not right. It's, 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 it's right at the level of our experience most of the time. It's not right at the level of the machine code, so to speak. And so- Machine code. <laughs> the, yeah, of the simulation. That's right. That's right. The, 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 the very lowest level of the fabric of the universe, at, at least under the, 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 the Wolfram physics model, is your senses is discrete. Right. So, so now- what does that mean? So it means, what, what is space then? So in, in our models, the basic idea is you say, there are these sort of atoms of space. There are these points that represent, you know, represent places in space, but they're just discrete points. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we know about them is how they're connected to each other. We don't know where they are. They don't have coordinates. We don't get to say this is a position such and such. It's just, here's a big bag of points. Like in our universe, there might be 10 to the 100 of these points. And all we know is this point is connected to this other point. So it's like, you know, all we have is the friend network, so to speak. We don't, we don't have, you know, people's, you know, physical addresses. All we have is the friend network of these points. Yeah. The underlying nature of reality is kind of like a Facebook. Uh, we don't know their location, but we have the friends. Yeah, yeah, right. We, we, we know which point is connected to which other points. And, and that's all we know. And so you might say, well, how on earth can you get something which is like our experience of, of, you know, what seems like continuous space? Well, the answer is, by the time you have 10 to the 100 of these things, they, those connections can work in such a way that on a large scale, it will seem to be like continuous space in, let's say, three dimensions or some other number of dimensions or 2.6 dimensions or whatever else. Because they're much, 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 much larger. So like the... Uh, the number of relationships here we're talking about is just a humongous amount. So the the kind of thing you're talking about is very, very, very small relative to our experience of daily life. Right. So I mean, uh, you know, we don't know exactly the size, but maybe, maybe uh, uh, ten to the minus, uh, maybe around ten to the minus one hundred meters. So you know, the size of to give a comparison, you know, the size of a of a proton is ten to the minus fifteen meters, yeah. and so this is something incredibly tiny compared to that. Um, and and the, the idea that from that would emerge the experience of continuous space is mind blowing. Well, what's your intuition why that's possible? Like, f first of all, I mean, we'll get in, into it, but I don't know if we will 
through the medium of conversation, but the construct of hypographs is just beautiful. Right. I, the, the, cellular automata are beautiful. We'll talk about it, but okay. Right. But, 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 but this thing about, you know, continuity arising from discrete yes. systems is in today's world is actually not so surprising. I mean, you know, your average computer screen, right? Every computer screen is made of discrete pixels. Yet we have the, you know, we have the idea that we're seeing these continuous pictures. I mean, it's, you know, the fact that on a large scale continuity can arise from lots of discrete elements. This is at some level unsurprising now. But wait, 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 wait. But the pixels have uh, a very definitive structure of neighbors. Uh, on, on a computer screen. Right. There's so, no concept of spatial, of space inherent in the underlying fabric of reality. Right, right, right. So so the, the, the point is, that, but there are cases where there are. So for example, let's just imagine you have a square grid, okay? And at every point on the grid, you have one of these atoms of space and it's connected to four other, four other atoms of space on the you know, northeast, southwest yeah. corners, right? Um, there you have something where if you zoom out from that, Got it's it. like a computer screen. Yeah. So the relationship creates the the spatial, like right. the relationship creates a constraint, which then in an emergent sense creates a sp like, yeah, like a, uh, basically a spatial coordinate for yes. that thing. Yeah, right. Even though the individual point doesn't have a space. Even though the individual point doesn't know anything, it just knows what its, you know, what its neighbors are. The, on a large scale, it can be described by saying, oh, it looks like it's a, you know, this grid, zoomed out grid. You can say, well, you can describe these different points by saying they have certain positions, coordinates, et cetera. Now, in the, in the sort of real setup, it's more complicated than that. It isn't just a square grid or something. It's something much more dynamic and complicated, which we'll talk about.